přátelé, tak... OK, I think uh, we can start. I hope it's not necessary to introduce myself, not because I am so famous, but because I'm speaking since the beginning of the project. So I, I think uh, the kind audience here present knows me already. And um, except for the little, I will, I will be introduced to you later. And, um, and I hope also that I'm even for that for the person who are watching. So. Um, As you see uh, on my back, uh, the topic of my lecture is not exactly surprising. It's about liminality and uh, maybe everybody of you already read something from myself about liminality or at least had the opportunity to know that I wrote a book which is entitled Liminal Zone. And um, the point is that um, having written this book, I was like convinced to have accomplished my duty Um, and that I have not to come back to the subject anymore, but um, the reality of our pilgrimage experience, uh, in despite of any my expectation, pushed me against to, the, to this notion. And therefore, I, I would like to discuss with you um, this notion of liminality. I would like to start from late antiquity, which is my main field and is the place which I most studied, so I will maybe repeat stuff which you already heard. Uh, in part, I will try to do it in a very brief way and maybe with a bit different point of view. But I will also try to cross a bit the cultures. I am not completely crazy, so I will not go through all the world, but I will at least try to stay to the Christian milieu and um, try to see if this anthropological notion, which is an anthropological one, of course, can be applied to some Christian rituals, and um, not only to the late antiquity. And then I will really try to think and discuss with you if this kind of question can be also and how it can be applied to what we are living now um, into the ritualization of the pilgrimage experience. So therefore my lecture will have those three main parts. I will start with the notion of liminality and the Christian initiation in general, not only late antique. Then I will jump to our main topic, which is the pilgrim, pilgrim's rest and the, the liminal zone. I wrote zones, but zone, but zones would be maybe a better term in this case, because I will try to say a few words about narthex, galleries, and maybe also, let's say, the external spaces around the church. Because the definition of liminality in himself is quite complicated in the sense that liminal is the place in between. So it could be one simple door, it could be an artex, an atrium, but also a less definite space, like an open atrium, for example, or, or even a square in front of a place, if it's necessary. <coughs> and then, um, After this first part, which will be more linked to the question of, let's say, space and architecture, I will try to focus more on images and objects which can be part of these liminal zones uh, through the Christian <coughs> world. So, um, starting with the first point, um, I think the main point, and I hope everybody of you knows it already, is that um, we have discussions about the Christian let's say, narthexes and atria um, since, let's say, three decades, four decades. And uh, those discussions are mainly focused about why Christian churches get atria and narthexes. And uh, of course, we can imagine that this is a sort of heritage of the antique building. Like, Pantheon had an narthex, why do Christian Christ church did not have an narthex? I mean, it's a logical question. On the other hand, Um, as you know, into the Christian culture, building culture, a part of the structure is a heritage of the antiquity, but there's a strong reappropriation of the, of the, of the, of the object. And then, of course, uh, and I think it's in, in, in part the geniality of the Christian liturgy, and in general, the Christian, let's say, attitude against the word, is the reappropriation and the invention of new solutions for existing spaces. So, for the question of the atria, atrium is not a Christian invention at all, as well as an artex is not, but <coughs> we have, uh, well, that's the reconstruction of St. Peter's Church, you of course know it, everybody, and um, 
the discussion about the function of those, this space uh, was animated in the last 30 years by several actors, but we can say that the two main voices were on one hand um, the beloved friend of Turtle, Jean-Charles Picard, mm -hmm. and on the other hand uh, our common friend Zible de Blau. And um, both were, let's say, working, wo wo working with several texts, uh, mainly with the Eusebius of Caesarea Christian history. Um, and uh, with the Paulinus description of um, the liturgical events which happened into the church of St. Peter's in Rome. And uh, the fascinating aspect is that Picard and de Blau, reading the same sources, speaking about the same object, propose different interpretations. On one hand, um, the question is the text in himself, where in the Eusebius case is explicitly said that the atrium is the place destined to whom who didn't get uh, the first initiation. And there is also the mention of the presence of the water. On the other hand, we have Paulinus, who is explicitly speaking about a funerary banquet, so a sort of funerary festivity which take place into the St. Peter's atrium. And so Picard's conclusions were like, Atria had no specific function in the Christian word, but slowly they become a place for burial and, let's say, that question, which is partially true. Um, Sibyl de Blau's conclusions are a bit different because he admits the same thing. There is no, F, let's say, in the fourth century, a definitive function of the Atria, but they take naturally the possible function for this kind of places. So it can be a funerary one, it makes sense, you are outside the space and you are inside, but it can become also a place for those one who cannot enter the church. And I can only agree with Zible, in the sense that uh, we know very well, and it's the reason why I'm quoting the Apostolic Consti Constitutions, that at a certain point, oh, I heard the micro, Peter, you know it. Okay. Um, that the Apostolic Constitutions are explicitly mentioning the fact that pe people who are not part of uh, the baptized have to leave the church at a certain point of the liturgy. And uh, as you see, I, 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 I quote several passages of the Constitution Apostolica because in the Syriac milieu in the fourth century where the Apostolic Constitutions were written, uh, there were different degrees of pre-initiation. So before entering to the church through the baptism, you get like three steps. And uh, those three steps correspond to the three quotations when into the Apostolic Constitutions, the per person are sent outside. So first the less initiated, then the a bit initiated, and then the almost initiated have to leave the place in order to, like, don't assist to what's happening inside. So um, what's for me the point is that necessarily those person has to stay somewhere and they will stay outside. They have to leave the place. In Rome, we have this uncertain source about uh, maybe their presence into the lateral naves. But um, my impression is that to send them outside is the most natural way. So in any case, the atrium becomes, with any plausible evidence, the place for those one who don't can assist to liturgy. And um, what I argued for Santa Sabina's case, that's the reconstruction of the Basilica Santa Sabina, is that this place, the Nartics, is not only destined to those who cannot stay to the church in general, but specifically those who need a purification to enter the church. On one hand, through the baptism, and it's the reason why in St. Sabina we have the beautiful source of the Liber Pontificalis, although maybe the source is a bit complicated, but let's, let's believe that it's probably true with the presence of a baptistry since the 16th period, so since the 5th century, uh, because we know for sure that the baptistry was in Santa Sabina from later sources. So we can imagine that the idea of the presence of the, of the fonts of the baptistry in Santa Sabina is already, already present. And um, that's, let's say, the question linked with the purification through the baptism, which is the big one, but then of course it's the question of the penitence. As you know, if you are a big sinner, um, you can be excommunicated from the church and you have to spend some time outside. And only then being re 
perfect, re pure in Rome. There is a special liturgy on the um, on the Ash Wednesday, I think. No, no, Ash Wednesday. No, no, no. <sighs> on the Lent Tuesday, you can enter back to the church. So you have this double purification in order to be admitted back to the sacral space of the church. So the case of Santa Sabina is quite interesting for me, as you know, because um, we have several sources which seems to confirm to it all plausible evidences. I am just mentioning them, but I will not enter into the discussion that uh, the very function of the narthex of Santa Sabina was really to welcome the persons who are supposed <coughs> to be initiated. And so that the Nartic Santa Sabina was the place for excellence um, for the persons who are not allowed to stay into the church. So Nartic as a space by excellence for a certain liminality outside of the external world, but outside of the church also, in the between. So what confirms, in the case of Santa Sabina, in my view, definitely this hypothesis was my door, of course, in the sense that uh, the door is activated only being closed. So, at the time, and when I studied Santa Sabina, I was quite convinced that is the main element to affirm that, uh, or not the main, but one of the cru crucial elements to affirm that the use of this space was definitely uh, an initiatic use, so a liminal use. So, and what I also try to demonstrate following the images, and I will not do it here because you already know it and um, maybe the public know, <laughs> know it also, is that um, the doors can be considered as a sort of macroscopic reflection on what the pre-baptismal preparation is. So that the space was conceived for the neophytes and that the images on the doors, the sculpted images, um, were part of their being neophytes. You are neophyte, you have to see those images, you are the only one, not the only one who can, but you are the one who had to use those images. So, for me, the stage of the late antiquity was crucial in order to demonstrate that there is a space and there is a use. The fascinating aspect is that if we switch for a couple of centuries and we enter into the Central Europe in Bzeclav, we have this kind of church. You see that maybe the architecture is not exactly the same as in Santa Sabina. But there is an interesting and paradoxical aspect, which is that the nave is almost so long as the narthex is. And when I was discussing it with Professor Mahache, who is the professor of uh, archaeology in Brno, early medieval archaeology, he was trying to find a liturgical function to the narthex. And he was imagining Byzantine rituals, which are not excluded in the sense that, as we know, let's say the Central Europe at that point was closely connected with Constantinople. But for me, another aspect was really interesting. It's the fact that, um, with any evidence, what was happening during the 9th century in the Great Moravia or Central Europe was basically the same phenomenon which happens in Rome into the 4th and 5th century, which is the massive Christianization of an adult popula population. And that the natural reaction in front of this increasing of the non-baptized is to create a special space for them, so a big narthex. So uh, the Great Moravia <laughs> example seems to me to demonstrate that um, the Christian reaction against the initiation of the adults seems to have the same rules. You have necessarily to create a space in between in order to put them somewhere. Mm -hmm. If I can be so vulgar, I'm really sorry. And what's really fascinating, that there is a third element confirming what I'm telling about in Moravia, which is what happens into the new world in 16th century. There is this example of the Retorica Christiana of Diego Valadez, who depicted the church destined by the monks to the Indians who were converted to the Christianism. And um, as demonstrated in quite nice well Monica Bernishikova, uh, Bernishinova, no? 
um, the church was smaller, much more smaller than the huge atrium on the Arctic, which was destinated uh, to the Indians who cannot enter the church. So in three different steps, and I would say without any, let's say, direct interaction, the Christian religion reacted in the same way to the necessity to work with persons who are like not part of the communio. So my conclusion was and is still that uh, the main reference in terms of intellectual references who can explain what's happening here is really the Arnold van Gennep text about Rive de Basal, uh, where Gennep, van Gennep, I'm sorry, is speaking about the notion of passer le seuil, which is cross the door. And he's also speaking about something really interesting, which is the rite de marge. So you are into the between two spaces, and before to start to enter into the main space, which is, for example, the baptism for the Christians, you have to leave a, leave a sort of other rite, which is specifically destined to the space before. So that you have a sort of ritualization of three different steps. You are outside, then you enter the liminal zone, and then you have a second right, and then you have the third right, which allows you to enter the space. So in terms of architecture, we can imagine first door, space, second door, space. So this double entrance space. So, what's for me like emerging from the three examples which I quoted is that we are really in front of an anthropologic phenomenon, which is not limited to one space nor to one time. And my following question is if we can apply this kind of reflection to spaces which are not directly linked with initiation, for example. Do we have the right to enlarge the notion of the liminality to other spaces, like, for example, during the pilgrimage word or not? And uh, my answer is definitely yes. <laughs> uh, why? Because as we observed in um, the last for two months, mainly but also before, we uh, can speak about at least two different, uh, let's say, steps um, of pilgrimage experience, maybe three. The first one is, of course, the walking one. <laughs> the third one is the being inside of the sacral space. And in the between, there is something. There is the necessity of the rest. Because after 35, 40 kilometers walk, you need the rest. And this rest has to take place in the very specific conditions. You need to be in an ideally warm place, at least well isolated place, and at the same time you need, um, if it's for example raining, a cover place. All banal observations, but who can explain what was happening, for example, during the 12th century in, uh, in Bezle, where we have this huge narthex, everybody knows it, and the narthex is not only very big in terms of space, it's a quarter narthex, so it's really a big narthex, but you have also galleries in the narthex. So you have really two floors of space where to put pilgrims who are arriving, who are tired, and who are resting. So there's this practical use of an narthex, which can here be explained by some simply the fact that you are tired. The pilgrim is tired, and you need the liminal zones in the sense that he needs, like, a space to, ref to get back his energy in order to pursue his pilgrimage, which is destined, as we know, to touch the relics. And um, I would say that our experience of persons who are walking um, can clearly define at least one point, that you will never accept to place to get rest two kilometers from the church, <laughs> and even not one kilometer. After 35 kilometers, you want just to sit down, and when you sit down, you will not move anymore. So that the fact that you are the, the very, very, very like in close proximity 
of the sacral space is on one hand a natural reaction to the fact that you are just tired. On the other hand, and that's also interesting, I would say that you are close to the sacral space. So you are not completely losing the contact with the main objective for your work. And what I would add is that we are imagining medieval churches, especially the monastic one, always, always open, which is completely wrong. There were moments in which the church were closed. Night, for example. Uh, and I would argue, but I have not arguments still, I, I have to search sources in this sense, that during the, the big prayers in big monasteries, where you have hundreds of monks and converses, maybe the sacral space was closed for the time of the prayer. I mean, it seems to me very logic. If you have 400 praying persons out of the church, that you will not allow two pilgrims to enter. Especially if they are maybe not crowds, but like a certain amount of them. So there is this practical use of the rest, which explains the existence of a space in the between, and uh, which seems to me enter into the notion of the liminality. There is another point, which is the <laughs> monastic hospitality. We, here we have the image of Holy Radegond, uh, which we saw also yesterday in the lecture of Cécile Loyer. And uh, Radegond is washing the feet of persons in a cl clear sign of hospitality. Uh, this sign of hospitality is a very Christologic one, as you know, in the 13th chapter of John Evangelist uh, um, uh, Gospel, there is this uh, clear description of this gesture, like a very Christian one. You have to do it imitating the Christ, because Christ as a Lord did it for his pupil, his apostles. Um, on the other hand, it's one of the classical gesture of the Christian hospitality in general. And there is this example, I was always thinking about this example, I didn't put the images because I realized it only later, having already finished my PowerPoint, which is the question of Osios Lucas, this church, 11th century church in Fossidia, where in the narthex you have depicted the Christ washing the feet to the apostles. And the main explanation, which is used by art historians, is that during the Holy Week, the Egumenon was, was performing this gesture under this image, which makes absolutely sense. I'm not, dis not discussing it. But the fact that he's not doing it into the church, but he's doing it into the narthex, seems to indicate that the narthex was linked to with this kind of, let's say, purificatory rituals. And uh, since in Fossidia, as well as in France, we are in the very important pilgrimage church and with a very important monastic church, my impression is that we can really imagine that part of the monastic hospitality, the most urgent one, was done in the very narthex, which makes sense also for the reason I already evoked. You have, like, you are tired and your fears are destroyed. You ha have no intention to walk anymore. So it's logical that if someone had to wash, and wash means not only washing, but also like help your feet to stay better with any sort of medicaments and I don't know what, he will do it in the narthex. Because you sit down there, you are tired, and it's the moment and the place where you need help. So the monastic hospitality seems to me to be the second reason for transforming in a certain sense or enlarging the function of the narthex, not only into the, let's say, genera general way of waiting, or having a small rest, but really a very specific rest for pilgrims. And I would also say, a maybe in a sense, longer rest, not like five minutes and then they push you, but really to sit down and maybe stay for a couple of hours. And yesterday evening, Cecile Way was speaking about uh, the hospitality maybe in Saint Benoit. She was quoting some sources and I'm speaking washing of the feet, which make absolutely sense after a walk, but you're also hungry and you need water, maybe a bit of wine also. So all this kind of, 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 of aspects can happen into the narthex. And you are not like destroying the sacrality of the space because you're outside of the church, but you are protected and to, you are already into the monastic space because you are inside. So that's for me really an important, uh, important reason in order to consider the narthex in the pilgrimage use as a, let's say, liminal space in sense of the 
rest of the body. And then there is the question which you already discussed, so I will just repeat it briefly, uh, about um, the galleries of Kong, but not only. You know that the galleries of Kong are huge, big and wonderful. If you walk there, you have a lot of space and um, you see really beautiful chapter, uh, ca capitals and you see also um, the space all around you. On the other hand, from the galleries now, you cannot really see inside the church. It's really difficult to see inside the church because you have like walls, large one, and so it's almost not impossible, but almost impossible to, to watch in, into the church. And then there is the historiographical problem because we have only one stair documented from the Middle Ages, which is very small and difficult to be used with very big stairs. And um, on the other hand, um, we have no traces about an original, let's say, construction of a place where you could walk into the galleries. Nothing. I mean, so, in general, uh, the narration of the historiography is uh, arrived at the conclusion that this space was just there for static reasons and that there were no reason, no one can accede except for a few persons who walk maybe on the walls or it's not very clear. And so, as we already discussed in Kong, my proposition was another one. It was to put in a wooden ceiling. And um, why I, I think it's so important, um, the presence of the wood, is because as we experimented in this very place, if you remember, <laughs> even if it's really incredibly cold, even though you are just under a roof, which is covered, but which don't really isolate, the fact that you are sleeping on the wood, helps in an incredible way. It was one of the best night, in despite of the fact that it was really cold. I was really afraid that we would freeze, and it was not the case. Because the wood is isolated in an amazing way. And it pushed me to, 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 to imagine that wood all around the galleries was an ideal place to get rest, to get a practical, important rest, and you can really stay for much more time if you have something to cover yourself. Although it would be I mean, on the stone, you will not survive. You will get ill very, very fast. And in the situation of cold, which is quite high, so it's a cold place, it makes really sense. And of course, for the Kong question, there's still the question of the access. But as we already proposed in Kong, it's really not, I, I would say it's not possible to exclude that the access was done from the main windows, because the hill is really close to the to church. And today there is like a, short space all around the church but from the north part uh, this space was constructed by a wall in 19th century so before 19th century probably the church was partially under under um, the pressure let's say of the mountain and in this sense it's really easy to imagine a short bridge helping the pilgrims to enter directly inside the space and get the rest there so in this sense i would propose that the galleries can have a, let's say, also liminal function. Well, the interesting aspect, and we will come back to it in a couple of minutes, is um, if it's possible to consider as liminal a space which is already inside the church, because the gallery is already inside the church. And, um, well, let, let's see it, because my impression is that the, the question of the seeing can be really linked with it. And then, of course, we have what we mentioned already yesterday in the very place where we are, so in in Sabina Sur Lach, where a, a rite of passage, the welcome kiss, is mentioned. And Cecile was underlining uh, underlying that this kiss is not necessarily um, a sort of exorcism, but there is still a sort of gesture of purification. So you get the keys from the monk who is welcoming you and then you can access. So, and uh, this kiss for me is crucial because now we have all the elements who can define the narthex as the liminal zone. Because you have a space between spaces. We have a space with specific function, which is to get the rest, to be welcomed, to, to leave the hospitality, to get food, for example, to maybe sleep. And we have this very ritual will permit you to access into the church. So, what I wanted just to say briefly in the second part is that um, 
the pilgrim experience in a certain sense, as well as the initiatic one, needs a special space. If you have a lot of adults, you need a court, an artex, or an atrium. If you have a lot of pilgrims, you need a place very close to the place where they are going, in the best way, inside, or almost inside, to get them the possibility to have the rest and to stay already into the presence. Because this is the second crucial point, which is that the holy presence is not limited to, to, to the relics. Of course, that's the very intense place. But um, in fact, the holiness is already in all the buildings. And so it, it makes, it, it gives a certain sense to this, to this space, which is outside and inside, but already into the presence. But you can still do things which you'll probably not do inside. Hopefully you'll not drink wine inside. But in the narthex, maybe you can get your, your wine and stay a bit better after having walked for so many kilometers. Mm. What's also interesting for me is that um, I'm speaking about this liminal zone, but I, as we already saw in many churches, we didn't saw it in physical terms, but in our mental spaces <laughs> is the question of the other enclosures who are inside of the church. So the liminality is not a notion also only be between outside and inside, but inside of the sacral monastic space of the medieval church you have other elements. You have the jubé, the place which is cutting the church into the part. You have the ecclesia laicorum, the space for laymen, and you have the ecclesia clericorum, which is the place for clerics. And in the monastic churches you have of course the place for the praying of the monks. So you have really different spaces which are divided by walls. And so this kind of progressive entrance into the sacral space and uh, the necessity to stop between different walls and the necessity to get different levels of initiation to the pursue is maintained in the medieval church. So in this sense, the anthropologic need of the cut and space it's something which pushes you really through all the Middle Ages. And not only outside, but also inside. And I would also add that my impression is that the necessity to cut the space inside is linked with the fact that everybody is Christian anymore. I mean, you don't have any pagan. So, except for the pilgrimage churches, where do you have this necessity of a space to get rest? The church is not divided anymore, but since human being needs division, you will create this division inside. So the, let's say, cubunio will be broken by those walls. And um, I will maybe add the last point, which is that we have documents for later period. That, for example, the narthexes of the Gothic church, Reims is the classical example, were, were used, uh, for example, for the justice, for the justice of the bishop or, as in Kong, for the justice of the abbey. So that those zones, even though they don't have any other specific functions like for the pilgrims or for the neophytes, will like necessarily attire functions which are not inside nor outside. The bishop cannot judge inside the church into the place where the caritas is dominating. He could not condemn someone. On the other hand, the power of the bishop is not the same outside of the church. So the liminality of the narthex is the very place where you can be the judge. So, and let's switch to our third point, which is image and sound. Um, why? Because we are speaking about, like, cut and spaces with a certain function, but what about uh, the use, the other use, which is maybe the most interesting for us uh, as art historians, which is the dialogue between the person, the space, the objects and the images. And so we will be back to my doors of Santa Sabina. I will just resume in two words what I already said, which is that the images here seems to be the illustrations of the main topics of the Christian initiation. So standing bored in front of the doors as a pilgrim, as a, pilgrim, as a neophyte, I'm sorry, you get the possibility to activate in your mind all the important, crucial moments of your initiation. So that's, let's say, the imaginary part. And as I know, recently we discovered, and um, I have to just 
say that the copyright office images from Andulka here present, that uh, the Santa Sabina's <coughs> door were a very specific one. Mm. Those doors were constituted by two walls, and in the middle there was an empty space. Today it's not the case anymore since they put in the 19th century in the middle of the wood, but with any evidence, <laughs> there was a really big empty space. And the second interesting aspect, and I'm sorry for those who really know this story very well, is that there's a series of panels like this one, which seems to be a wooden one, but if you look carefully at them, you'll discover that they are from inside covered by a textile. Mm. So that those panels are in fact carved and empty. And um, I would barely imagine a wooden carver so crazy to do something like that just in order to do it. It needs a purpose. And uh, what's more fascinating is that uh, we have six of the five of them conserved, but you can imagine that they were in all eight. So that two levels of the doors were covered by those panels who let the sound enter into the doors. So it get the possibility to make the sound entering into the doors. And so the question why can be answered by this sort of scheme, which is that as we know the sound is reflecting himself and the reflection of the sound pushed reverberate the wood. And in this sense, the sound will come out from the other part of the doors. And uh, what's for me the most fascinating is that it can explain why this door is so strange. Because normally if you have doors, you don't need to divide it in so many small wooden panels. And by the way, you don't need to construct a door with like four or five millimeters thin panels, which is quite difficult if you want to carve those panels. It's a bit of suicide. But they did it because tiny panel will let filtrate better the sound on one hand. On the other hand, they will easily reverberate. And by the way, uh, one of the main question of the doors of Sabina was the question of um, the material. Why Cyprus? Well, maybe the reason can be in the fact that for this ex his excellent acoustical propri proprieties, the Cyprus is still to the use for the fabrication of the flamenco guitars. The cypress is an ideal wood to create sound, to create a nice sound. And by the way, speaking about sound, we can also speak about pure sound. And we can imagine that the textile put on here by can help to purify the sound. But why? What, I mean, what is happening? My idea is that it's the final in the Christian initiation is the final step um, to convince the neophytes that something crazy is happening inside. Because the neophytes spent like the half mass, half liturgy inside, and then they were living outside. And they were inside with 30 persons. And they were singing with them, of course, because the Christian liturgy was always full of singing. And then the door were closed. And suddenly they hear people singing inside but they were twice more, because the sound reverberated by the doors was amplified by the doors. So in a sense, the person staying into the liminal zone of the Christian narthex had the illusion that angels entered inside. But what I wanted to say with this example is that there is a series of multi, let's say, sensorial experiences which are prepared for the person who is staying outside. You see the images, you hear the sound, and with your imagination, you can, on one hand, relive the experience of the Bible. On the other hand, you are really imagining the sky open inside, because you are hearing the core of the angels who are already entering. And by the way, if I'm right, it could explain also one other mystery about the Santa Sabina doors. You see the small holes who are indicated by my blue lights. Um, no one never like take cares about those holes and I didn't did it in my book about Santa Sabina. It was just like hole. But the problem is that and uh, now we can have an explanation because these kind of holes are often linked with textiles which are supposed to cover something. And now we have maybe the reason why this door can be covered. Because if the door was really a musical instrument, an amplification of the sound, 
And if you really want to use it in certain specific occasions, you don't need to show it to everybody before. So you can cover it by a textile who is cutting the sound in order to don't get the sound outside. So we cover by the textile doors for all the rest of the years and you open it only for the important moments. And by the way, the presence of the textile can explain one of the other mysteries of the door of Santa Sabina. Why did they survive? Because they were covered. Because the main explanation of the past was like, oh, in the 13th century, Dominicans already closed the Nartex. That's right. But from the 5th to the 13th centuries, we have still a bit of time in order to de destroy the wood. And in this case, it seems to not be necessary. So, the late antique example of the Santa Sabina's door demonstrates that the liminal zone into the initiatic space can get special images and a special sound in order to let's say, permit the person staying outside to get in contact with what is inside. Um, in Mexico, in the 80s of the 16th century, there were really special altars constructed for the indigenous who were not allowed to enter the church. And here, unfortunately, it's also a bit of racist stuff because they didn't allow to the indigenous to enter inside the church even after the baptism. They were like pushed out, even baptized. And um, only after a few years of experiences outside, they had the right to enter inside the church. But in any case, in a very interesting language, we have a depiction destined to the freshly initiated or to the non-initiated indigenous, by the way, speaking a special language for them. So we can really to imagine objects which are constructed for a very specific use. So, and now when we move, let's say, back to our pilgrimage churches, we will get a three of interesting monuments which seems to be really conceived to be seen by persons who are, in my opinion, getting a rest. I already told you in Conk about the first one is the main tympanon of Kong. The main tympanon of Kong is incredibly complex. It's so complex that you don't understand it. You have uh, the text which are almost possible to read, and uh, you can read if you can read, but you, I mean, you need like destroy your head in order to read them. And you have, especially into the health part, really an incredible amount of images which can attire your attention. So my, ex my explanation was the same which was proposed by Nicolas Bock for the tapestries of the 15th century, which is that you are on the citizen's board, you have a certain time because you are tired, you are getting rest, or because you are not allowed to enter the church. So the image, in despite of the pedagogical effect, can also have a second level of effect, which is an entertainment, just entertainment. So the Kong's case seems to me an example of a classical use of complex images for a space uh, which is supposed to invite you to enter, but also to stop you. The complex image, as well as what we saw here in the narthex, can do the both thing, invite you to enter, and at the same time, if you are really like curious, you will stop. And if you are getting caressed, if you are waiting in front of this door, if you are getting, uh, waiting something in front, you can spend in a useful way your time because you can admire all these scenes of the hell. And uh, because of it, you can become a better Christian, which is, by the way, a very important element for the moral of the 12th century. Um, as well, we discussed the being in Beaulieu, the portal of Beaulieu. That's the classical image of the portal of Beaulieu. By the way, if you put portal of Beaulieu on the net, you will get that. So very frontal views of the portal with a lot of details. And though if you arrive from the east, which is the point of view destined to the pilgrims who are arriving first time, first you understand why the Christ is not in the middle, but a bit on the lateral side, in order to see him better. On the other hand, you will understand, and I'm sorry for the self-promotion, but it's the only photo which I find. <laughs> this is so this interesting dichotomy of the some person speaking twice, one in reality, one in the dream. You can understand the presence of those benches all around. 
which are the ideal place for the rest of the pilgrim. So you arrive, you see the portal from lateral side, and then you see if you are tired immediately the benches. And the first thing you will do arriving to the benches is to sit down on them. And then sitting on the benches, you will start to see the portal which is all around you. So in the sense, the image seems to me be conceived for this very point of view. Sitting on the benches, you can see in a very nice way the lento, the trumeau, and of course also very well the Christ of the Parousia who is arriving. So the point of the view becomes for me the one of the pilgrim. The pilgrim arriving and tired is one of the main center of interest of the person who conceived these images. Or, yeah, one of the main center, maybe not the major one, because the frontal point of view is still existing. I mean, it makes also sense to arrive like that from the square. But we are here again in a sort of liminal zone in the between, between the city and the church. And this place is conceived to be the place of the rest. And this place has images which can be better seen if you are sitting. By the way, they are the images of the tympanum who are visible in a different way if you are sitting on the benches. And then you have the images um, <laughs> on the two walls, which are almost visible only if you are sitting there. So there is really this double narration which is conceived for the persons who are arriving, uh, who are arriving to the um, to the Beaulieu church. So, and uh, of course, we are back to Saint Benoit. We discussed it yesterday. I would say that Saint Benoit is the clear example. The sort of forest of columns where you are a bit lost, and where you have many different places to sit down, many different benches, and uh, as we saw yesterday you get some images who are properly visible only if you sit down. The Annunciation seems to be like in a very bad position, except for the fact that if you sit down and you are just like that because you are tired, you will see perfectly the Annunciation. So you are into the liminal space and there are images in order to get a dialogue with them. You And they are th those images, as well as the doors of Santa Sabina, can be activated only if you are a tired pilgrim. If not, you don't see them, because you will not see this lateral point of view. And um, of course, as we, as we saw also history, for example, the example of uh, St. Martin in the, the narthex, in the tower of, uh, of St. Benoit, seems to also be the proof of what was happening inside, so the bonus hospitality. So the images, on one hand, can be a sort of stimuli, intellectual stimuli, for the tired pilgrim who still can do something with his brain because the feet are tired, feet are tired, but you can still use your brain. On the other hand, they can help you in sort of pedagogical, moralistic aspects. And then, of course, there is the other aspect, which is that they can celebrate what's happening there. So this sort of link between images and, let's say, liturgy. But in this sense, it's not liturgy, but just events who are happening there. Mm. For me, well, two other aspects have maybe to be underlined because we discussed about the question of the galleries. And I told you that in Conca, I'm sorry, but this is the only view of the gallery from this point of view which I have, is uh, almost impossible to see inside of the nave. But we are still into the church. so which kind of relationship can have the pilgrim, which is maybe resting in the galleries of Kong, with the church. There are some images, the capitals, we have like a lot of them. So that can be the same use as outside, as into the narthexes. But there is a second aspect. And this reason why I told you about the doors of Santa Sabina, because there is a sound, the oral architecture of uh, Bissera Penceva. I mean, the sound who is incredibly well hearable in, in, in Kong, you can have your rest. You will not see what's happening in the church, but you will hear. So you have, will have images and sound. And as pilgrim, you will just have the possibility to activate your spiritual eye, dreaming what you will see 
into the following step when you will enter the church. So you will be through the sound into the presence of the holy place. And that's for me something really remarkable. Um, okay, I will conclude with uh, one last image. It is the main door of the Cathedral of Salerno. Present, of course, in a sort of literal and at the same time liminal space. Uh, the door is uh, quite interesting with those small crosses, with those small illustrations, decorations. Um, why I'm quoting it? Because there is in preparation a book about the doors of Salerno and especially about another aspect. We were now discussing only, let's say, the rational and intentional aspects which are linked to the liminality in the initiation and I would say into the pilgrimage experience. But you don't have to forget that there is also the instinctive uh, let's say, really deeply human attitude towards the object. And in this case, the door is quite interesting because it's covered by small inscriptions. Inscriptions who are testimonying about three facts. First, that this door was the ideal place of rest of pilgrims. <laughs> because they were in front of the, in evidence, closing door, because you cannot make incision if the door is not closed. And the pilgrims were from Armenia from Italy, probably from France. They are in very different languages, inscriptions present on the doors. And that's the first point. So people from outside are inscribing. By the way, probably those pilgrims were going to Santiago or to Jerusalem through Salerno where the body of Matthäus, the evangelist, is buried. So it was one of the main stage of the, let's say, second half Middle Ages pilgrimages. So there is this spontaneous aspect but which testifies that the liminal zones were the space of the rest of pilgrims. There is the other aspect which is linked with the apotropaic use of the doors. Already Jean-Michel Spitzer demonstrated that the doors are, of course, a place to open, but also to close. And yesterday we discussed into the narthex of uh, Saint Benoit that you cannot let enter someone inside who was not like purified before because the presence of the devil is a major danger. So, the doors are the place of the protection. And we have small, spontaneous inscriptions which are testifying that the doors are the place of the protection. So that's for me the, the second aspect which is interesting, because the two elements, the pilgrimage experience on one hand and the initiatic one, seems to touch here, because if you are not baptized and you are not allowed to enter into the church, you are always in danger. The devil could come and attack you. You need to be purified in order to enter. As well as if you're a pilgrim, you need to leave the silva in order to enter into the church and only there you will get your rest <coughs> and your protection. So the doors are the space who are closing and opening and protecting, being closed. So, and the last element, it's uh, the definitive, I would say, confirmation of the fact that those phenomena are truly anthropologic because we see them from the late antique Italy until the early modern America, from the Santiago Sway until Salerno. The use of liminal spaces is something probably deeply involved into the pilgrimage experience. So thank you for your attention. were not too bored because I'm afraid that everybody of you knew already what I wanted to say but uh, if there are any questions I am I'm of course happy to answer them. I'm curious about that um, kissing ritual you mm -hmm. were talking about specifically here in Benoit. How can I imagine that, that the pilgrim came here and was not allowed to enter the church before this purification ritual or how? It's what Cecil was talking in about it these terms. I don't know it was like so juridic one, but if you imagine that really the narthex is the place where you get the first stop and the doors are closed, you arrive, the doors are closed, you sit down and the monks arrive to help you. So you get the first level of hospitality, they wash your feet maybe, or you'll get water at least, maybe they will not do it directly, but you'll get the water and you'll get a bit of food. And then yes, you will get the ritual kissing and then you can enter the church. I don't know if this ritual, I mean, it's always a problem with these verses. You don't know if it's the rule 
which cannot be changed at all, or if it's just in special occasions. For example, if an important person is arriving, because the kissing is a purification gesture on one hand, on the other hand, is a welcoming one. Yes. So you can you can have it in this context also I, as a special event. On the other hand, uh, try to imagine that you have a, any kind of space which is not always open. And you are the person who is like in the between. Your role is to introduce the persons inside. You will give them the hand. You will do it with each one who arrives. I mean, if I will ask you to be the person responsible to welcome guests into the Center for Early Medieval Studies in Brno, and you will like have a small chair in the entrance of the center, each person who arrives, you will just speak with them. You will maybe touch them. So I would say that it's not something so surprising that uh, a pilgrim who is arriving here can have this sort of personal ritual before to enter the church. Are there any other questions? And the washing of the feet is the same also. <coughs> I mean, it's also a purification. Of course it's not is. only hospitality. Well, the question is... it's all this question of the also in other cultures. Yeah. I mean the washing of feet is another point mm -hmm. which is quite interesting because, well, honestly, I don't have now in my hand any clear sources about it, mm -hmm. so we have to investigate it. But I would, uh, I would try to imagine, or I would imagine that if they were really washing the feet, of course, there is the double level: purification and welcoming, as well as the kiss. Can I ask about the feet because it's about washing feet? Yeah. I don't know if it's, if it's right, but in the uh, baptistery or orthodox baptistery, there is this iconography in the baptistery. It's not the iconography, it's just the inscription. Oh, inscription. But, um, but we thought that there could be. Yeah, I, I, mean, I, I, I thought it. <laughs> no, oh, okay, I, okay, I yeah, wrote it I wanted to ask about, about this because you said it was also used like a latex for, for people who were not yet baptized. If there could be this possibility, for example, later in the Russian Baptistery, this ritual was performed there in the Nartex, or yeah. for the ba ba Baptistery ritual. There are so two different levels. The place was the same for the pilgrims as for the Neophytes, and it could be. Well, the problem is that you don't so have any Neophytes later. But let's say that the washing of feet in, in the Milanese space where Ravenna was part of, is something which is linked to really with the ritual baptism, baptism and it's explained by Ambrose as uh, the last step of the baptism and is the last step of purification, with any, without any doubt. Um, Gianfranco Sottocornola, who studied it, uh, explained the origin of this ritual during the Lent night by, um, by the Assyriac tradition, which was superpo superposing uh, the Lent with uh, the Last Supper, mm -hmm. in the Syriac Johannit context, maybe. So that's a very specific kind of, of thing. And uh, this tradition, which will, will be well spread in the Gallie, um because of the importance of the Milanese liturgy, and it will remain probably until the 6th century. But then, with the end of the use, massive use of the baptistries, it will, in a certain sense, disappears. And, uh, it will be replaced by the Tuesday ceremony, which is really like the illustration, a sort of liturgical drama of what happened during the Christ's last days. And this very ritual happens in the Arctic. But at the time, they were not any more adult uh, who were becoming neophytes because everybody was baptized. So that's a bit the problem. But the end, yeah. <laughs> well, I wanted to ask you said that um, you wouldn't allow or they wouldn't allow people, pilgrims, to enter the church during the prayers. If you consider the number of the prayers going today, it would be much time not to allow people to enter the church. But why would why would you think that they wouldn't allow them to enter? Because like if you if you imagine uh, hundreds of pilgrims, maybe it, it would make some sense. But if like pilgrims, they are not together; they are coming and then going away. And like it's if they are in small groups, maybe it's it's um, 
So th there are two like interesting aspects. First one, I would say that mainly all pilgrims arrive at the same time. Because you are walking the day and you are arriving in the evening. Yeah, but you don't walk the same. No, 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 of course, but you are arriving almost the same. I mean, someone starts, I mean, you are starting with the sunshine and we are speaking about medieval pilgrims. So guys who are used to walk. I mean, persons who are really strong. They are walking 50 kilometers per day. Someone is a bit slower, someone is a bit faster. But as we know from, uh, well, for example, Liber Calixtinus, they are walking in group of at least 30 persons because of the security reasons. Yeah, they are like, they were trying to walk. Yeah, also sometimes maybe, maybe sitting on the road, one or two, three persons, but sometimes they are waiting on some different places to be a big group and then cross, for example, the forest or just. Okay. So there is because it is dangerous. So if you are a big, higher group, bigger group, it's less difficult to kill you all, for example. So there is this question that you are walking in groups, and I will argue that they are arriving mainly into the evening. I would say at the time when the monks are praying the vespers. And um, now the question is why to close the church? I would, for example, definitely. Much <laughs> no, <laughs> <laughs> You will, uh, you, I will definitely close the church because it will really disturb me. If I'm like singing with, with, with hundreds of persons something, which is an important ritual for me, and then there are guys who are arriving like tired. Oh, what the? I mean, no, but. Like they, they know how to behave in the church, or like they are not. Well, we are, and, uh, we are art historians, and still we don't know how to behave in churches. No. That's another interesting aspect. Yeah, that's a great. But uh, just to finish my reflection, that you're right, Anishka, I would say that um, there is this really thing which can disturb. But, but there is this other stuff, which is the question of the space. If not for all the prayers, because you have the two levels of praying. You have, I mean, the monks who are praying seven, nine times per day, and you have the converses who are praying. I I don't remember if three times, but at least three times each day. But there are a lot. So if you imagine the conch nave which is a short one. And imagine already 200 monks. You already covered the third half of the nave. And then imagine the same number of converses, maybe more. Well, you have the church, which is already close to be full. So if you want to f make entry persons, I would. And there is also the question of the control, except for the kiss and the welcome rituals. There is also really the question of a certain control of who is entering inside. And do we have any sources about this, or just is this a kind of um, trying to, to find a logical answer? Because it seems to me also that now maybe we are just imagining the sacred space as really something very protected. And no, and, which, which and was and not, of course. Which was not, of course, and there was there could be noise and pigs and dogs and so on, so why not pilgrims? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but it's, it's, it's a little bit... Yeah. It's, no, no, it's, it's just maybe we should search from, from some sources to... No, we have definitely to see sources. To be, to be sure. But, you, you know, the, the idea is from Zible, and uh, if I remember well, mm -hmm. and uh, when he was speaking about the high numbers of persons in, in Kong who are already part of the community, it makes sense. And on the other hand, um, I mean, the second point is that you can really imagine that in the evening the cho church will be closed. It's clear that you will not open the church for the night, especially if you have the golden sculpture of Saint Foy inside, and especially if you are a monk of Conk and you know what you did in Ajaccio a couple of decades before. Yeah, that's <laughs> also excuse me the question. Maybe there are some people who, who just will just wear as the guard of the church even if. Night of course, you can imagine protection, but it's much more easy to close the doors. And we don't have to really to forget that we are we're in a much more dangerous period. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are not speaking about 21st century and nice forest. I mean... But couldn't they be in the galleries or upper level of the, of the tower or some place uh, where well they could rest during the... That what I was is the reason why I'm thinking about the gallery <coughs> for Kong because it makes something idea ideal. You can enter there, you can have your rest, you cannot jump into the church if you're not completely crazy. But you don't go to, you cannot go to the toilet, for <laughs> <laughs> If you have the the, 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 the the bridge, of course you can. Oh, you can go, go outside, but, yeah, but, but not inside. Not <laughs> inside. Yeah. So it really works. 
Well, yeah, yeah. No, some some space which is I mean, yeah. but we we get some 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 place where we slept like that, which was not yeah. inside nor outside. But also, I heard I don't know who, who said it that there, there were people in I don't know in which period exactly who were paying more to be allowed to sleep in the church. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In the someone who was talking about this. And also it was in the anthropological <coughs> text, no? Maybe mm. it was there. Yeah. Yeah. So <coughs> it depends, maybe there were people sleeping there and it was just kind of privilege or there were so many people who wanted that they could pay. Hmm? That's possible, but I don't exclude that. I wanted just to say that we can, we have to imagine the sacral spaces playing with the notion of open and closed, which is from the, uh, I mean, late antique beginnings, a part of the show of the of the, the church. You have open doors and you have closed doors. And uh, well, in, and though you are making skeptical faces, Carolina, we are, have searches about it, that some doors were really closed <coughs> and uh, other were open. And we are just playing with this, with this game. Am I okay with the question? Yeah, no, I, it was more like uh, what Monica already suggested with the galleries. Yeah. And then, like, it's maybe a very stupid one. Yeah. But it's like, sorry. No, if, if when you said that there are also like these uh, liminal zones in already inside the church, I was just thinking about the yesterday example of Cecil of the Ambulatorium, yeah. which is kind of like a meditative space. Mm -hmm. And it's like around a very secret space, like yeah. a crypt, which could be also closed for a like longer time. Yeah. So there is just like some kind of vertex of this sacred space, and this the space around is also accessible only for like someone who can kind of meditate here. So if we can also consider these parts, which are really inside, inside, as kind of like liminal ones. Mm. Yeah, I would say why not, but um, the galleries around, I mean, the, the, the ambulatories around the, the sacral space, I would not exactly define them as liminal, in the sense that because you are- there is not no the open uh, but is aspect. Well, it's interesting because you have a sort of enclosure, so in the sense you mm. cannot cross the border. Yeah, you are in front of the borders. Mm. Because in the Van Gelebe book, he's speaking about borders. For him, the, the main idea of liminal zones are the borders between two mm. cultures. Because you arrive to the borders, then you have to get the ritual of passing the border, which can be the passport, and then mm. you are inside of another country. Mm. So where you have borders, you have liminality in a certain sense. So we can extend the notion in a very large way. I was now trying to think about really conscious liminal zones, mm -hmm. which are really in yeah. between the words. And for me, the, the, the ecclesia laicorum and clericorum will become two zones mm -hmm. very different when the, 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 the separation will be so high that you will not see anymore. Mm -hmm. So that, that's the, maybe the point. Favorite and then Katarina. So my question is just really short. I was, you were speaking about the sound uh -huh. in considering the Santa Sabina though. And then in galleries, of course. Yeah. But at the same time, we did not mention it uh, with the with the matrices of these medieval churches. So I was wondering whether we remember some like uh, trying to amplify the sound in these senses. Well, is this <coughs> well? I have to admit my perfect ignorance on the one hand. On the other hand, uh, the fact that I don't uh, know enough doors. Uh, but um, the amplification of the doors from Santa Sabina seems to be quite exceptional result of real to late antique engineering. I mean, if you remember the doors of, of Le Puy, it's just a piece of wood. So the huge complexity of the doors of Santa Sabina is something really absolutely exceptional from what we know. And there are people who are not believing in my theory at all, even though I think my arguments are quite strong because they cannot believe the medieval person can invent something so complex, even though it seems to me like it's a musical instrument. The other point is that I never experienced what can happen, for example, in Vesle, if you close the wooden doors. Would you hear something what happening inside or not? And maybe yes, because the, the, the acoustic inside is very high, but it will be like a different, it will not be amplified by less Le less, less but is it more like up to like making you more interested with this inside? Of course. Have more yeah, no, more definitely yes. Like but the, the goal would be a bit different. It will be in this case maybe more accidentally, but still we hear. You want to enter, and in Santa Sabina it was like to really become crazy, because you were inside like a couple of minutes before, and suddenly you have twice more person inside. So what happens? It's like a shock. 
But I agree absolutely with you that it can be like, what's happening? I want to <coughs> enter. But it's the same as the what you showed today. At the moment where they disappear into the crypt, the imagination starts to work and yeah. it's much stronger because they can be transfigured when they're, I mean. Yeah, of course. Of course they can. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Katerina. Oh, Katerina, sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to ask about the, the question of galleries. I haven't uh, visited many galleries in France. Maybe the Kong is the only mm -hmm. uh, place where I visited. Uh, what is the like typical way to approach the gallery in the, let's say, Romanesque? Well, uh, I don't know if there is the outside, from the inside. No, it depends on the situation. For example, the, the very well-known studied example is Toulouse, where you have huge galleries, similar to the Kong's one. And in Toulouse, if I remember well, the research is quite univoque. They are considered as place for pilgrims, and you have stairs, and so on. And so Kong was considered as a pilgrim space at the beginning, before they discovered that there were no, uh, no um, <coughs> floors. And or no, no, like floor some stones. So this this case for me the other thing which we observed now in the church we saw is that we have you have all galleries or a big narthex, but it's rare to have both of them together, which is interesting, because it could be like the two strategies which can be part of the of the welcome of the persons. Or the narthex, or the galleries. Because in that in that sense, the, the let's say hard access or um, not so easy access mm -hmm. to the galleries from the inside would make sense because it would be secluded and yeah yeah it just like and the other point which pushed me to uh, imagine the entrance to the con galleries from let's say the street the street is because we have an example which seems to be not surely but very probably accessible like it, which is St. Agnes in Rome. Of course it's a 7th century church, but it's a church also into the hill, and the entrance was probably <laughs> done by from the galleries. Or you have at least two different entrances, galleries and the main church, and in St. Agnese also you get like the possibility or to circulate in the galleries or to enter the church. So the, the double use of this pilgrimage church seems to be quite plausible. The galleries were there from the beginning? Uh, in Santa Agnese, yes, definitely. As well as in Kong. So you, you, they are like really part of the of the construction. Okay. Maybe I yeah? Maybe it's a question for everybody. Does anybody uh, remember what was the main iconography in the Kong on the galleries? Because I'm just interested what kind of iconography is where if there was some kind of this hospitality repeating and so on, but because but I do not remember what was. No. On the there, capitals in Kong. There, there were a lot of knights. Music, musicians. Musicians. Yeah, musicians. Knights. But musicians not in the... Mm -hmm. It was, it was from the cloister, no? Yeah, what was it? it the ones I which I were there in the small room were from the cloister. Ah, uh, mm -hmm. uh -huh, okay, okay. No, I, I remember the knights. The knights, there were some... Yeah. Some yeah, biblical episodes, yeah. some really strange one. Mm -hmm. There were the really narrative ones? Yeah, there were some narrative ones, but not... I mean, yeah, not... No, no, so here you see the knights yes. fighting. There are like three battles at least. Yeah. Which can be interesting because the battle is always a battle between, I mean, the devil and the, and the saint or the good and the bad. So in this kind of space which is between, makes sense. Yeah, but still a little bit surprised me that there is no depiction of these hospitalities. But maybe, well, I don't remember if there is something. <coughs> don't there. The there can yeah, well. Frescoes or also textiles, because you were discussing it in Kong that uh, it's very noisy if you're on the galleries and people will hear you inside. But if you put the textiles, mm. you will just like be cut in from the sound point of view or partially cut in. Mm. And then the textile can be decorated because you have a lot of decorated textiles, as for example the ugly embroidery of Bayer. <laughs> mm. I had still some question because for me what's difficult is. We are either talking about the space as being completely, let's say, pure, uh, with a lot of um, walls, mm -hmm. space, very difficult to access, and on the other hand, we are speaking of the place where there are 
pigs and dogs and everything. So for me, I don't know, is there just metal to be found in this? Because I cannot imagine pigs running around everywhere in, con in the church. <laughs> <laughs> like Carolina was saying, oh, there were pigs and everything. Now, Carolina was, still Carolina was speaking about the very late source. There is this source, uh, 15th century one, yeah. if I remember well, of Lausanne, by the way, mm -hmm. where there is a visitatio pastoralis in one church, and there is the bishop of Lausanne who said, well, we saw pigs everywhere. But <laughs> maybe <laughs> it was the church, no, maybe Karina was also referring to the, to the Trident and Council, which yeah. is, which, which, is uh, which forbidden. Yeah, the, presence. The, the, the presence of the animals I don't think and the, the, the wash uh, but is the laundry in the church and it was definitely not the rule, not the rule. and, and I, I would even say that if it happens sometime it, well on one hand we can also imagine that it's also linked with the end of the middle ages which is yeah. quite different than mm -hmm. this and the other point is that in Kong I mean, I would barely imagine that the monks will allow the porks to enter into the church. <coughs> and since the monks were the owners of all, basically all the, the space, no. So, you are right that, uh, no, well, what is underlined in the Dreden Council and in mm -hmm. those sources of pastoral visitation is always linked to small parish, a bit decadent, but I cannot imagine in Berner Clairvaux's churches, pigs running everywhere. I mean, it makes no sense. So there is like because also in the in the literature they, are, they have a clear concept mm. of what yeah. is the border. Of course. I mean, even I'm, I don't know really well the the, the medieval liturgical text, for example, or yeah. the religious text. But in the in the like world as well, they have a really really clear uh, idea about what you can cross, what you can uncross, what is transgression, mm. and this is a really strong concept in all those texts. Yeah. I mean, it's top it's topos. That's sure. It's the reality must be very different, but still. The transgression is very, very strong aspect in it. Yeah. And it comes, I mean, from the ancient testament. Mm, of course. The Moses idea of paint your doors so, it's so that the devil cannot, I mean, that and that's it's protected. Yeah. So it's been protected. Of course. But they have to be closed in some <coughs> because we need the closing doors. It just, it just came to my mind that maybe the idea of closed door can be explanation not like to exclude pilgrims themselves from entering, but maybe to restrict somehow the, the noise and the, the things uh, which were... Happening to the village. <coughs> no, 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 there were um, plenty of stalls, plenty of merchants, because if mm. you have a strong mm. pilgrimage place, you have plenty mm -hmm. of people who wait for pilgrims and wanted to sell them something or whatever. And to protect and the in, from Beaulieu, this in Beaulieu, for example, we know for sure that this is the market. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Just in it's not as well, even in the lateral mm -hmm. size of the... Yeah, and uh, so no, that's an, uh, the Gucci mark. Yeah, I would definitely close the doors, not only because of the, let's say, and not only the noisy of the market, let's say that's a very practical reason, but in general, if you have this idea of a certain purity into the liturgy, and I'm sorry, but Gregorian is quite, I mean, you need to hear it. So you need to, to stop the noise in a certain sense. And I would barely imagine that they were so tolerant that they were like allowed it. And well, also yeah, the walking can be Yeah, seriously. But close, yes, but locked people to, to, you, to join I them even if, if you, you close, are like you, If you close, like, you like, like, I don't know, for me it's like against uh, well, the, the very okay. question. I will, I will show you an example. <laughs> the door is open. I didn't build me. I'm the favorite pilgrim. <laughs> yes, ah. but, but for the pilgrims who were like really kind no, of... But they no, but like we, we did, we did <laughs> in churches. Now, during the two most, <laughs> we experienced serial <laughs> thing. One of the things that we are incredibly noisy. We are incredibly noisy, although we know that it's not good. When we enter the church, we are so noisy. And even if you are like trying to don't be noisy, the sticks falling down in each church. <laughs> <laughs> At least one <laughs> stick fall down. But for sure, it's a big difference between us. Yeah, yeah, between no, us. No, Anichka, we are really trying to don't be noisy. So but then the sticks are falling down. Maybe the bishops who are describing pigs were describing. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> no, but apart from the bishops, <laughs> do you recognize but yourself it's so in easy <laughs> to be noisy in but such a church. But with the sticks, with the doors, you can even don't don't evaluate well. I did it now for purpose. But some doors are like faster closing, other slower. I mean, if you don't want to be disturbed during your prayer, you're nice Gregorian. You'll close the door and you lock them. Yeah, but you want to people to come. You want 
close people inside, like lock them inside. And then if you imagine 200 monks singing Gregorian together. In they this don't have to be disturbed, that's right. In this acoustics, it's like poof, it's, it's all over the place and it's very, it's no, very right. loud. It's no, but I, 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 like I agree. Like one falling stick wouldn't, uh, wouldn't <laughs> interrupt the, the singing. Would, would Except for the solist. Yeah. But why there and isn't there smaller entrances? Or not of course, there are smaller entrances, so you can block the, the main one, but you let, of course, mm -hmm. the entry. But I know it's surprising for me how shocked you are by the edit close the doors. Mm -hmm. I mean, you are living in houses mm -hmm. which are closed and locked. Yeah, but but every time there is a mess, like for example, when we came to Benoa, we just immediately joined uh, the prayer. But mm -hmm. it's the only it's the only moment when the churches are open now. Now it's the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. I mean, now the churches are closed all around the day, and for mm -hmm. example, in um, I don't know where we were. It was the place where we didn't slap it, the presbytery. It was the um, no Mondoré, Mondoré, mm -hmm. Mondo, Mondoré, Mondor, yeah, Mondoré. Mondoré. So we went to uh, the church was open because there is a mess. The all other time, the the, the, the church is, is like closed, and we are not shown by that. In Czech Republic, all the churches are closed all the day long, or the main part of them. Yeah, 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 yeah. in Brno is a bit different, but still, the main part of the Czech churches are closed all day long because there's nothing happening inside. But I want to just say that closing the door, I mean, if you have doors, is because they have to be closed at a certain point. And it really, it's also a question of expectations, and it's also a question of making people, like, attentive to what's happening inside. And it's also to don't permit <coughs> everything. Called. I mean, it's a bit in the, the article which read about anthropology. There was a bit this idea of closing. Because then when you are allowed to enter, then to be something. And then, I mean, if you if you really believe strongly into the power of Saint, Saint Foy, for yeah. example, you know that you will not enter to disturb her at one point. Because she be can also... Because she can yeah, she can. <laughs> I mean, that's also one. Yeah, that's right. Point, I think. The belief into this other space. Yeah. That is clear. It's the same in the initiation. So, uh, no other questions. So, thank you. No, I, I had last in topic, Yeah, please. Yeah, about, about the Salerno doors yeah. inscriptions, I'd like to ask how was it perceived, the inscription? Was it vandalism? Or do we have some comments <laughs> about the inscription? <laughs> 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 it's sacred space, and yeah. I think some inscriptions are conserved in Koyor as well, in mm. the more sacred space. And how was it perceived? I, I have no idea about the sources. I have to be honest, I was a peer review of a book. I don't know who is the author because I was not in this review and I read this book about the Salerno doors. I have no idea uh, about the rest apart from the book which I read. And um, the author was not speaking about any sort of reaction. But since we have everywhere the small stuff, I would be instinctive. I would say it's vandalism from, I mean, Havirov to. To, to Salerno. So it's something which is not well seen by no one. On the other hand, it's something so present in the humanity that is like that. And in, in the Salerno doors, you really see that they were like s probably sitting close to the close to the door and they were like doing that. The other stuff that this, this sort of reappropriation of the place, at the end of the book of Michele Bacci, there is this description Jesus is Lord on many other graffiti from 21st century. They were restoring the church and they were making graffitis there, making the like the trace of the passage there. And it's something really deeply present in the human being. And I have no, I cannot explain it to you why, nor, f well, nor was the deep reason, but it seems to be something very really deep anthropologic to reappropriate your, the space by your inscriptions. Uh, Spizer was um, trying to say in his article about doors this question of the apotropaic defense and he was like telling that official images and graffitis are doing the same, that they are protecting the sacral space. So it's the reason why you have the images of the Christ, of the Virgin on the doors and uh, for my case in Santa Sabina, the Pharaoh dying, so all the images of the devil who is like destroyed and then you have the spontaneous graffiti with the very, very same function. 
So I don't know if it's a good answer, but it was really bad even the melee is for that. Okay, now, now I want to just show the last images that I didn't, didn't show, which you already know, is what we saw last year in um, Dax. Dax. Just to say that uh, the, the furnishing for the pilgrims can be in very different places. Like here, the apps with the images. If the situation is an original one, I would imagine then yes. Then we can extend the pilgrim liminarity on every place where pilgrims are, like walking, and you want to stop them. And in this very case, the liminality could become a way to stop the pilgrims. I was not thinking in, about it in DAX, but now I'm pretty sure if you put such a benches, you are almost sure that the pilgrims will enter your church. Because if they walk for 35 kilometers and they sit down with benches, they will not move anymore. <laughs> we did it because we were at the beginning of our... Or it was no, no, we didn't move from the city. After having experienced DAX, and we have like, you sit down, and then we, we had not the li even not the physical, but really the mental force to leave the place because <coughs> we are sitting there. So you put the benches, it's like getting the pilgrim because you gave him the place to get the rest, and then he starts to stay in there inside. Okay, so basta. <laughs> Thank you.